So we'll just wait for attendees to join us. Lots of people coming in now. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to tonight's program. My name is Michael Frederick. I'm the executive director of the Thoreau Society. Um, tonight's program is sponsored by the Thoreau Society and Princeton University Press. I would like to thank um, Jody Price at Princeton for putting this program together and um, bringing together um, tonight's featured speakers. Um, we'll be discussing um, Robert D. Richardson's posthumous book, Three Roads Back, How Emerson Thoreau and William James Responded to the Greatest Losses of Their Lives. If you enjoy tonight's program, you can support the Thoreau Society at thoreausociety.org uh, through the donate button or by becoming a member. Um, and just a quick shout out to the Thoreau Society will be having its annual gathering this July 12th through the 16th in Concord, where we'll be um, discussing the theme of the annual gathering, uh, Thoreau and the Politics of Extinction. Um, so I am joined um, by with the Thoreau Society president, Rochelle Johnson, who will introduce our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's, it's so wonderful to be here uh, in Boise, Idaho, joining uh, you there, Megan and, and Larry. So good to see you both. And we're so grateful to have you with us. And it's really special tonight to be honoring and celebrating the work of a beloved member of the Thoreau Society community, Robert D. Richardson and, and his, uh, his new book. So thanks to you all for being here and especially to our panelists. It's my honor to introduce uh, Megan Marshall and Lawrence Buell. So I will do that and then step aside and we'll listen to their conversation. We're gonna save uh, time at the end for your questions and comments. Um, and we aim to conclude remarks uh, with at least 10 minutes left for your um, comments and questions, which you should enter into the chat feature. Um, of Zoom. Megan Marshall is the Charles Wesley Emerson College Professor at Emerson College and is an award-winning biographer whose writings illuminate Thoreau's immediate community and his wider world. She's also the recent recipient of the Thoreau Society Walter Harding Distinguished Achievement Award. We were thrilled to give her that honor. Of her many writings, I'll mention uh, just two, perhaps the most germane to tonight's conversation. Megan Marshall is the author of The Peabody Sisters, Three Women Who Ignited American Romanticism, which won the Francis Parkman Prize, the Mark Linton History Prize, the Massachusetts Book Award in Nonfiction, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Biography and Memoir. Her other title that I'll mention is Margaret Fuller, A New American Life, which won the Pulitzer Prize in biography and the Massachusetts Book Award in nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Megan Marshall has been a very good friend of the Thoreau Society, regularly attending our events, helping plan them, lecturing them, participating, nurturing connections between us and our sister organizations, several of them. I'll mention just the Louisa May Alcott Orchard House, Thoreau Farm, and the Margaret Fuller Society. Thanks for being here tonight, Megan. Thanks. I'm also very honored to introduce uh, Professor Lawrence Buell, who is Powell M. Cabot Professor of American Literature Emeritus at Harvard University, where he taught from 1990 until 2011. Dr. Buell is also the recent recipient of the Thoreau Society Medal. He's author and editor of, of many books, as is Dr. Marshall, but perhaps I'll mention four especially germane to tonight's discussion. His 1973 literary transcendentalism, which is, has been a Bible to many of us. His 1995, The Environmental Imagination. 
his 2003 short biography of Emerson, and his forthcoming book in 2023 uh, on Thoreau. We can't wait to see that one. Lawrence Buell has also been a very good friend of the Thoreau Society, um, delivering a keynote address at our annual gathering, participating in many panels and discussions, and also a regular uh, attendee of, of many events, including our picnics at Thoreau Farm. We're just so thrilled to have you both with us. And I know that you are as excited as we are to honor this, this great new book by Robert D. Richardson. Thanks. I'll hand it over to you, Megan. Okay, thanks, thank Rochelle. Um, thank you, Rochelle and Mike for the wonderful introduction. And um, here we are. Getting getting set. I want to make sure I'm I'm speaking to you all. Um, yeah. So thanks, Mike and Rochelle, and I really want to thank Princeton University Press for this beautiful, uh, small but really important book that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Bob's wife Annie Dillard for her role in bringing this book to us, and his daughter Anne and brother Dave who helped me in. Um, getting things right in the foreword uh, to this book. I also want to acknowledge that there are many on this Zoom call um, who probably, who knew Bob better than I did and, and longer than I did. And um, I'm grateful that you're here and uh, hope that this will feel like something of a celebration tonight. Um, I got to know Bob in the 1990s when I was at the beginning of my work on the Peabody Sisters. And um, I was also grateful that he treated me seriously. I had never written a biography before. I had no PhD. He answered my questions and really more than that, he seemed to just always believe I would get this book done even when I wasn't sure I would. It was a 20 year project and um, he was there to cheer me on throughout and, and when I, made it to the finish line. Um, I last saw Bob in July, I think it was 2019, when he'd come up to um, have a paper read. He read a paper at the Concord Museum, and I was part of the group of commenters on this paper, another celebration of Bob's you know, lifetime of work in the transcendentalist realm. Um, and my partner of 15 years had died just to maybe two months before that. And I was kind of shaky and told Bob that. And he said, well, you know, um, loss has been much on my mind the last year. He'd been working on the manuscript of this book, which he called then Resilience. And he said, you know, I could, I'll send it to you. And he did. So I read this book first in manuscript um, on my computer. And I, um, I took it for what I think he initially meant, a kind of consolation, a way of seeing that uh, writers can get through a time of loss and, and go on. Um, then, you know, mercifully, the book found its way to publication. I know he sent the manuscript to a few other people who were in sort of similar circumstances. And the books that he wrote late in life that were short, sometimes it was hard to know, you know, what publisher would take them. We're very lucky that Princeton took this book and now we can all read it. But what I'm gonna start by doing is reading just a, a short section from my foreword, um, which describes the experience of reading this book a second time um, and how I really came to understand more of what uh, Bob's uh, project was. And, um, and I think it'll be a good introduction to the conversation. Uh, so he had written to me about um, that, that his book was about Thoreau, Emerson, and James and, and their bad losses. So here, I'll just read a page, a couple pages here in the small book. Reading Three Roads Back, that's what the book Resilience, uh, its new, new title, the title it has now. Reading Three Roads Back Now, with three years distance from my own bad loss, I realize how much more there is in this small book than I could absorb at a time of need. Bob liked to quote his own mentor, Walter Jackson Bate, on the value of linking ourselves imaginatively with the great figures of the past through biographical reading and writing. 
The practice, Bate wrote in The Burden of the Past, allows us to become freer, freer to be ourselves, to be what we most want and value. These lines served as epigraph to Thoreau, A Life of the Mind, Bob's first biography. Yet Bob was never in the self-help business, not even with Three Roads Back. I had read his manuscript for instruction, seeking a recipe, and I had missed Bob's point. As much as any of his magisterial biographies, Three Roads Back is a consideration of how America's foundational thinkers arrived at their ideas. It just happens that death played a role in the process and in the ideas themselves. Emerson, Thoreau, and James were young men when they lost a wife, a brother, a treasured cousin. They were at the dawn of their careers, scarcely cognizant of what might become their life's work. Although loss was a feature of most young lives in the American 19th century, a hard truth to which many were forced to adapt, Emerson lost both his father and an older brother by age eight, a younger sister three years later, these particular deaths arriving to mingle with and dash our protagonists' fledgling hopes for the future were both devastating and catalytic. Through a combination of self-examination and confrontation with the facts of the outer world, Bob writes, each of the three ultimately achieved a view of death as an inescapable part of living and an acceptance that at some level there is no death. For Emerson and Thoreau, nature revealed that the very process of decay is a life process. For James, the philosopher of the will, the realization was more profoundly internal. Death sits at the heart of each one of us, James wrote, enabling us to gather the resources within ourselves to maintain a true and courageous spirit. These notions achieved in bereavement inspired the mature philosophy each one began to explore and expound in his writing from the moment of recovery. Genius is the activity that repairs the decay of things, Emerson wrote in his essay, The Poet, a drive to repair the rent in the fabric of their lives through which they had glimpsed the near fact of death impelled all three. When Bob tells us their examples of resilience count among their lasting contributions to modern life, he means two things. We can learn from their examples how to find our way back and what they gave us as they moved forward became American philosophy. So I think I'll, I'll pass the virtual mic on to Larry. He can speak a bit about his connection with Bob. And Thank you, Megan. Um, with all that you've said, uh, I heartily agree. Um, as you characterized uh, what this uh, last book of Bob's delivers, um, I'm delighted to be here together with, with you uh, to honor Bob's memory. Um, a friend of more than 30 years, colleague, uh, of whom I was immensely fond. Um, in fact, we uh, knew and read it and supported each other's work uh, before we even met face to face, uh, which came in uh, the 1980s as he was just finishing the first of his trilogy of biographies, uh, the one on Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, The Life of the Mind. Um, for a while, uh, he and I and uh, a couple of other uh, scholars of transcendentalist ilk uh, would meet um, in the wintertime uh, at uh, the Modern Language Association convention uh, in what we called um, uh, the Transcendental Club uh, by no uh, accident after uh, the one that sometimes met in Emerson's living room. Um, others uh, on board were Joel Meyerson, uh, David Robinson, um, Philip Gura, excellent scholars all. Um, many other rendezvous I could recall over the years, uh, down to uh, just a few years before he died. Um, uh, one uh, lovely long summer dinner at our place uh, before his uh, keynote, last keynote at the uh, Thoreau Society in uh, that July. Um, 
where we we reminisced and um, he uh, talked about all sorts of things, but didn't give any inkling of this last project. Uh, the first I heard of it was uh, from uh, Princeton Press and from Megan. And uh, it's uh, striking that Bob brought this uh, work together uh, in his mid 80s. It's kind of like uh, Sophocles completing the Oedipus cycle at the age of 87. Uh, I'm impressed, uh, a mark to shoot for. Uh, he was a first-rate scholar, an admirable person, a model of intellectual generosity, as Megan has testified, uh, encouraging younger scholars uh, and peers, uh, utter absence of professional jealousy. Uh, how many of us could say the same? Um, and none, nobody um, more influential in our lifetimes, so I believe, in opening up the lives of the three figures that he um, treats at length for a wider readership. Um, in a distinctive style of intellectual biography uh, that goes something like this. Um, we talked about it some over the years. Uh, Bob endeavored to read everything that his protagonist read um, as preparatory uh, and then track the mind in motion uh, of each of his three subjects as they absorbed it. Um, you can uh, imagine the ascending degree of difficulty. Uh, Thoreau read a lot, uh, but Emerson read more. And James um, almost overwhelmed him, he said, uh, trying to take in uh, his uh, entire uh, range of reading. Uh, then he would relate the subject's inner odyssey uh, via short episodes, a hundred apiece for Thoreau and Emerson, uh, a few less for James, um, somewhat arbitrary, perhaps, and yet uh, the way of framing the life allowed for both momentum and a lot of periphery along the way and not overclaiming about um, the coherence of the life narrative, uh, which struck me as, uh, still strikes me as a great strength of uh, what Bob wrote and uh, one of the reasons for its endurance, its continuing uh, suggestiveness. Um, Bob seemed to have the whole history of Western literature and thought at his command somehow. I'm sure that was partly smoke and mirrors, but uh, I shouldn't use that phrase because there was no deception in it. It was uh, a, a kind of unpedantic, uh, very broad angled uh, ability to recall, recall and uh, connect uh, different uh, moments in uh, time with different moments in his subjects' lives. Greek, Latin, German, French, Italian, he knew them all or he knew them some. Um, a kind of 20th, 21st century Renaissance man in some ways. Um, I'll have more to say about uh, Three Roads uh, Back, uh, which is a different accomplishment from the trilogy, but uh, after having just overviewed uh, what I think are some of the points of uh, Bob's uh, three, uh, if I can say that, canonical works, canonical biographies, uh, defining, redefining the genre for uh, this historical moment. I'll flip it back to uh, Megan, who um, will have more to say about the Thanks. biography. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, I wanted to um, say that although Bob uh, made a point of describing his process in this small book is rather different from what he'd done before. He describes it as documentary biography, by which he means he's he's really going to immerse the reader in the documents of, of these figures' lives, quote at length, um, and in a way let them speak for themselves. Of course, Bob is a biographer and he never let go of his own voice. And uh, if you look at this book, um, you could look at this book as a kind of 
uh, manual for the for tricks, biographers' tricks of the trade. And I want to uh, highlight a few of those. Um, the first one has to do with just simply um, using great details to conjure up a person. As uh, Larry says, much of his work on these figures had to do with following their reading, but he was very good at uh, giving a little character sketch, a physical one. So here, here's how he describes Emerson in this book as he's uh, returning from his mm -hmm. trip to Europe after the, after the, that he embarked on after the death of his, his wife, Ellen. He returns to the United States. He was a tall man standing six feet in his shoes. He had narrow sloping shoulders and a long neck and he carried himself erectly. His eyes were very blue, his hair dark brown. He wore loose fitting clothes and struck some observers as looking like a prosperous farmer. He carried his money in an old <clears throat> wallet wrapped in twine. Now that's the genius. <laughs> that detail um, brings it all together. Um, here's a few other tricks when he's um, telling us, you know, what, what's the biographer to do when you don't have some documents to work from? Um, this comes up when he's um, describing Thoros, the death of Thoros' brother John, and I won't read the whole section, but um, he tells us John died the next day, Tuesday, January 11th, in, in Henry's arms. He was 27. We have few details about his passing. So what, what's the biographer to do? Well, he finds, you know, uh, an a explanation of, of this terrible tetanus that overtook uh, John in a contempt, more or less contemporary mm -hmm. account by Dr. Charles Bell, tetanus following gunshot wounds from 1809. Um, and he gives some description. I'll let you read that for yourselves. But um, and then concludes, Henry is reported to have told a friend that John was perfectly calm, even pleasant, while reason lasted. And gleams of the same serenity and playfulness shone through his delirium to the last. Then Bob says, the references to while reason lasted and delirium suggest that Henry was putting a good face on a scene that was not all calm and serene. So there's the biographer stepping in. Then, then um part of the drama of this book is um we we know that uh Thora was keeping his journal regularly but he stopped with the death of his brother and so then what's the biographer to do um another section involves um Bob taking a sort of wide view Thora made no journal entries for the next five weeks though the wide world rolled on and there he gives us some wonderful context about um William James was born, and uh, over in Jalalabad, there was a retreat from Kabul. And so anyway, this, this is another great biographer's trick um, uh, and uh, very, very effective. Um, and a, a last one from, from this book is, um, again, I, I guess, um, Another point I'd like to make about the book is that uh, it's been described in reviews as a distillation of, of Bob's three great works, but he's doing new work here. He's reading these journals anew. And um, one of the uh, uh, points where I really realized this is how um, he notices that um, he, he begins the section on Thoreau by quoting that last journal passage, the one that he'd written before uh, the brother died. And then the next great writing he does is his Natural History of Massachusetts, an assignment from, from Emerson for the dial. And, um, and Bob, reading carefully, notices that the language of this uh, new writing that really releases Thoreau into the nature writer that, that we know um, is very similar to the language of the that last journal passage, and he draws that connection in just just a wonderful way. A close reader, a close biographical reader of this evidence of these documents. Um, and I, I want to end my little disquisition on Bob as biographer by what I think of as his most genius moment, um, jumping to actually the death of of Thoreau himself at the end of. His biography of Thoreau. So many of you probably know there's a great debate about what were actually Thoreau's last words. And there's been writing on this since 
uh, Bob's book, The Thorough, The Life of the Mind. Um, and Bob himself knew it was a little hard to, hard to be sure. So this is how he finesses that. Um, he tells us that um, on the morning uh, or near the time of his death, Thoreau had had a conversation with his sister Sophia, out of which came that wonderful uh, line, now comes good sailing, as Sophia had been reading to him um, the week again. Um, that wasn't the last words. And maybe the last words were moose and Indian. That was another account. But Bob doesn't want to end on moose and Indian, and he doesn't want to end on a phrase that he knows is not really the last word. So here's what he says. No more satisfying deathbed utterance can be imagined for Thoreau than his reply to a question put gently to him by Parker Pillsbury a few days before his death. You seem so near the brink of the dark river, Pillsbury said, that I almost wonder how the opposite shore may appear to you. Thoreau's answer summed up his life, one world at a time, he said. So Bob got to the ending that he wanted, even if it wasn't Thoreau's actual last words. Larry, why don't you say a little more about the ideas in the book and how they strike you? Well, I will. Thank you, Megan. Um, uh, let me first say that I've been taking notes on all you've said. And if I ever write a biography, uh, now I have a bag of tricks that I know I can pull out. Uh, and all that you describe uh, in the book is is uh, true of, of, I think, too, of the craft of of Bob's work. Uh, in particular, the uh, passage where he she negotiates the silence in Thoreau's journal by riffing off uh, all the events in the world, the various events in the world that are taking place at the same time um, in Jalalabad, the birth of William James. Um, uh, that, uh, in addition to being a biographical trick, it just strikes me as very Bob. That's one of the ways that he really benefits from that characteristic style he has of writing uh, episodically uh, in the hundred parts and the longer works. But to uh, loop back as to my impressions of uh, the three roads back uh, specifically, um, I do see this as certainly having uh, a family resemblances of with the three biographies and building on them um, using uh, new material as well as new thoughts. Uh, but um, as a person who, who tends to think in terms of genre, uh, it strikes me as a very different kind of accomplishment, not just because it's shorter, uh, being um, not a narrative chronicle um, elegantly done, but a thesis book uh, focusing on the shared configuration that Megan has described in the lives of each of these three men. Uh, resilience uh, demonstrated uh, by the processing of the experience of loss itself uh, as something uh, that um, prompted growth, um, loss of Emerson's first wife, Thoreau's older brother, and James's much loved cousin. Um, so it's in keeping with the three biographies that uh, handle those uh, episodes not too, too far differently, but being accentuated here, that particular crisis is made to feel uh, immensely more pivotal to the whole life achievement of each of the three protagonists. Uh, so we're kind of shifting from um, intellectual biography stem to stern to a kind of crisis psychobiography, if I can call it that, crisis psychobiography. Um, and uh, how one uh, parses that accomplishment uh, I will just say in the very short form, for me, goes like this. Um, I think he hits the bullseye on Thoreau, that uh, that that uh, thesis uh, absolutely can be made to um, 
made uh, arguably central to uh, the pivot um, uh, of Thoreau's maturity. Uh, he doesn't come to maturity so quickly, as I think Bob um, implies uh, in the treatment of it. But then uh, this is a short book. Uh, his treatment of each of the three cases can only be episodic. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in view of that, uh, it's very, very resonant and true. And I say this as somebody who just finished writing a book on Thoreau. So, uh, Argument from authority, there you are. Um, Emerson, uh, I think his treatment to Emerson is very close to the mark. Uh, his um, emphasis on uh, the grievous loss of his first wife, um, Ellen, uh, the tuberculosis uh, in their her teens and his 20s, um, as opening up the um, very different pathway out of the ministry and into uh, Emerson as we know this figure today, uh, also very true. Um, I was a little surprised that the book didn't concentrate more on the imme more immediate aftermath of, of that loss. Uh, it's within the next, within a year of uh, grieving, less than a year of grieving, that he really arrives at the epiphany of the idea of the inner God, the uh, spirit within, uh, as the uh, authority of authorities. And um, Bob wants to uh, connect uh, the loss of Ellen with uh, the uh, next epiphany that he has uh, that propels him towards thinking and writing about nature uh, several years later. And there's something to that as well, I think. But it's interesting to me that uh, he he put the emphasis on that rather than on uh, the uh, discovery of, so to speak, the original relation to the universe, which is uh, the uh, insistence that he makes is accessible to all uh, at the beginning of his first book, Nature. Um, with regard to uh, his um, emphasis on the importance of uh, the loss of uh, William James's fav favorite cousin, Minnie, early to tuberculosis, again, uh, like uh, Emerson's first wife, um, I'm not uh, enough of a Jamesian biographer to be able to pass an authoritative judgment on how persuasive that is. Um, it uh, seemed to me that uh, uh, th there are other factors uh, that um, made for uh, James going into a tailspin at that point, such as being uh, a kind of depressive character uh, by temperament. But uh, it's a striking uh, take on James. and. Uh, I think uh, very uh, resonant in ways that I suspect Megan will uh, describe when I yield the floor again um, uh, in um, Bob's uh, understanding of the importance of women figures in all three of uh, the lives of all three of these people. Um, I uh, will say I especially uh, was struck uh, pleased, um, admired how uh, Bob ends or almost ends uh, his book with um, a remarkable passage from uh, the end of Emerson's essay, Compensation, which is one of those uh, essays that even Emersonians tend to love to ignore, uh, which uh, encapsulates the core insight uh, that I think uh, he's analytically trying to deliver. Uh, so uh, Emerson, uh, in a sense, has been there before him, although uh, Emerson could not have written this book. Uh, you need a biographer with the wisdom of hindsight and uh, comparing uh, the three lives to be able to do that. 
but I'm going to read it, I think. Uh, this is Emerson's prose, not Bob's, but um, uh, not the least of the deep wisdom of uh, Bob Richardson was his ability to go into uh, the works of each of his subjects and pull out just the right uh, passages, just the right aphorisms or uh, sequences uh, to use uh, as the uh, luminous foci for uh, the uh, rest of uh, the work. So Emerson writes as follows. Uh, the death of a dear friend, wife, brother, lover, which seemed nothing but privation, somewhat later assumes the aspect of a guide or genius, for it commonly operates revolutions in our way of life, terminates an epoch of infancy or of youth, which was waiting to be closed, breaks up a wanted occupation or a household or style of living, which was waiting to be closed, um, allows the formation of new ones, new styles, more friendly to the growth of character. It permits or constrains the formation of new acquaintances and the reception of new influences that prove of the first importance to the next years. And the man or woman who would have remained a sunny garden flower with no room for its roots and too much sunshine for its head, by the falling of the walls and the neglect of the gardener is made the banyan of the forest, yielding shade and fruit to wide neighborhoods of men. Um, well, um, if there's a key uh, in the canons of Thoreau, uh, Emerson and William James uh, to Bob's thinking about them in this book, that's it. And Good for Bob. Uh, kudos to Bob for uh, having spied that. So over to you, Megan. Yeah. Thanks for reading that, Larry, so beautifully, too. Um, I wanted to just say a little bit about the women in the book um, and um, Bob's role as an encourager of women scholars. I, I want to call out some who I know he was particularly influenced by and and helpful to Phyllis Cole, whose Mary Moody Emerson work really, I think, changed Bob's thinking about Waldo, um, Helen Deese and her work on Caroline Dell, Sandy Petrolinus, Noelle Baker, so many of us uh, working um, on men and women of transcendentalism, the women scholars, I think all felt supported by Bob and he was one of these men who did seem to get it um, just instinctively. And that comes through in his treatment of, of description of the women in the lives of his characters. And in this book, um, you know, you could imagine that someone might describe these young women who died of tuberculosis as kind of ethereal muses with not, without much substance. But Bob gives you a very strong sense that these women, they didn't last long, but but they were there and foundational. And here's uh, just a brief bit about Ellen, um, who Waldo had met when she was 17, married when she was 18. He was eight years older and she was dead before the end of her 19th year. Ellen had wanted to be a poet, had called her dog Byron, and surviving examples of her writing show real promise. And he quotes this poem. So I, unless God's loving, guiding love had brought thee to me from above, might now have lived but half in one, a moving world without a sun. And Bob doesn't just quote this poem. He uses that last line, a moving world without a sun, as the title of one of the small chapters in the small section <laughs> about uh, Emerson. I'm not going to say too much about Minnie Temple because really at least half of the section on William James is taken up by representing Minnie Temple, his cousin with whom uh, Henry was also very much taken. Um, and she's very strongly portrayed there, maybe one of the best portrayals of her in this short book and even though she's not the subject. Uh, but I was also moved by his um, readiness, and, and I think this comes over time, to, to uh, see the women of transcendentalism. And of course, I took note of a 
a reference to Elizabeth Peabody. Um, and th this is part of what made me realize he's doing new work here. Um, he, he says that when um, uh, Emerson came to see Thoreau after um, John's death, he brought him a book and, um, and uh, Bob has figured out what that book was. Um, he went to see the stricken Henry. Emerson brought him a book just published by Elizabeth Peabody, Guillaume Uger's The True Messiah, for this is what Thoreau was reading and taking notes on the next day, Sunday, February 20th, as he took up his, his uh, journal again. And um, Uger, he describes as a Swedenborgian who believed that because everything in nature stands for something in mind, the entire physical world then functions as a visible language, a collection of emblems we can decipher. And he goes on from there. So, you know, this is new stuff and this is putting Elizabeth Peabody, I'm always glad to see right in the middle of, of um, you know, Thoreau's transformation. And I was grateful that he dug that up. Um, so I think um, we're, we could start taking some questions if we're starting to have some questions. Mike was going to to field them, um, and um, or they could also be uh, just comments on Bob's influence and his and his work. Um, happy to do that. Hi, um, so I'm back, and we'll field questions from the audience. Um, I sort of. I'm reflecting too on, um, you know, Emerson says all, all history is biography and sort of history is the study of loss and loss is sort of, you know, is deep memory and, and deep time in some ways. And loss is, a, is basically the condition of life too. And um, as biographers, you're, uh, as each of you are, or both of you are biographers, sort of wondering, has Bob's um, book helped you to sort of reflect on your own work? And uh, do you have thoughts about that? Um, that's a good question. Do you want to try go first, Larry? You're, you're in the midst of a book on this. You're asking, uh, though, not how Bob has influenced us as um, writers but how he's touched our lives right and how reading the book has maybe caused you to reflect on your own work as biographers right well i uh i tend to put these two things in separate categories i think about bob uh, as uh, a model of my own uh, aspirations as a scholar, not that I'm a biographer, that's not my genre, really, even though Rochelle credited my Emerson book with being a, a real biography, it only is a real biography in the first of its chapters, it's a series of uh, profiles of facets of his achievement. Um, but uh, I think of Bob as a, as a guide in, in that sense, in a very personal sense, uh, as far as how his uh, work has influenced my own. Um, well, um, I think that uh, as um, important as anything else, I'll just cite one example, uh, since it, it relates to uh, how I've been thinking about Thoreau. Um, Bob uh, was um, one of the first, not in his biography, but later, to uh, realize the, uh, partly in his biography, partly later, to realize the uh, significance of Thoreau's late natural history writings, the turn to science. Um, others have picked up on that later, uh, but uh, the um, uh, sense early on that Bob had welcoming uh, the discoveries of, or the, the uh, exhumations of the late uh, manuscripts and publishing them, uh, and connecting them to uh, Thoreau's life aspiration. Uh, that's uh, something that I really admired him for because he'd already done Thoreau and he was on to other stuff. Uh, and to be able to look um, forward as well as be um, 
uh, influenced uh, inertially by what you have done, uh, uh, that's uh, that's a really admirable trait. Um, I think it's Zhuangzi that says um, uh, everybody can um, uh, correct their past mistakes, but it's very hard to move ahead their, their past omissions, but it's very hard to um, improve on what you have previously taken to be good. Well, Bob could do that. Um, and I think this last book shows it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, one way in which uh, I see him to be uh, a model for me uh, writing about Thoreau today. I've written on Thoreau. I've written a book that's largely centered on Thoreau. Uh, this one is different. Hallelujah. Thanks be to Bob. Mm. You know, as, as um, Larry was describing the um, great accomplishment of Bob biographies, the intellectual biography, the showing how the mind developed these ideas, um, something I can't remember now exactly the phrase you used, Larry, but it reminded me very much of what Elizabeth Bishop, about whom I wrote more recently, aimed for in her poetry. The the mind she wanted to capture the mind in the act of thinking. Um, and it strikes me that, um, you know, Bob was a, a literary writer. He was, it's a kind of a poem of the mind that he makes in these much longer epic poems of the mind that he's, he's written. So maybe that's something I would aim to do too. Somebody asked a little while back was, um, uh, how, how did Mary Moody Emerson, uh, counsel, Waldo after Ellen's death, and I would have to defer or maybe hope that one of the scholars of Mary Moody Emerson is listening and could type something into the chat as far as an answer. I can't really say. I know a little more about her her uh, active involvement in, or at the time of Charles, his brother Charles's death. Um, and uh, I see another question. I had mentioned Annie Dillard's help in bringing this book to press, and and um, I know that she was intent on getting it out there, and that's the main thing. It, it fell to her to to uh, make it happen, and it's happened. Um, there's also a um, literary agent, Andrew Blauner, who I'd like to credit, who who matched the manuscript with Princeton University Press, but it was a kind of the ideal thing to start with. So um, thank you, Annie and Andrew. Yeah, we, we do have a question. Somebody, well, I lost it. <laughs> um, somebody is um, curious to know uh, um, if or how the book addresses Emerson's grief after the loss of um, his son, Waldo. Yeah, the, it's again, a, a, kind of clever biographical trick here because um, that death, the death of little Waldo is very proximate to the death of John Thoreau. So that kind of enters into the section about, um, about Thoreau and Emerson's grief is very present, but a little bit in the background um, to Thoreau's. But he does note that the day of, of um, Little Waldo's death, um, at the end of the day, he starts writing to people about it and uh, seems, he doesn't say this directly, but I was reading the passage recently to suggest that that something about the, the deep loss, the immobilizing loss over Ellen, he had uh, learned something about how to, uh, how to move forward, even as, um, we also have the scene where Louisa May Alcott comes to the door and, and Emerson really can't even speak the name of his son who has died. So um, it's very much there in the book. Uh, I, th I think Bob would have had to struggle uh, with that one uh, if he had extended his section on Emerson. Um, the way he, as I, as I read it, the way he uh, brings in the death of little Waldo. Uh, it's an event in Thoreau's life, uh, a kind of um, collateral or ancillary trauma on top of uh, the 
uh, main one of the death of John. Uh, but uh, Waldo's death uh, is a kind of midlife crisis, early midlife crisis or paroxysm that Emerson experiences. And um, I think it would take have taken a lot longer for uh, uh, Bob and led to a, a, a book that lacked the sort of balance and, and symmetry that this one has. If he'd um, uh, gone into that here, uh, if Bob had lived to the age of 95, I would have loved to see how he would have handled um, midlife events um, uh, if he could have found collaterals in uh, Thoreau and um, James that would match that. But um, I think there's a reason why, uh, a good reason why Waldo doesn't um, uh, appear as a part of Emerson's inner drama in this book. Um, it couldn't have in order for it, the book to have the concentrated power that it does, focusing on uh, the um, losses in youth and recovery from that. Somebody mentions that, um, you know, John Thoreau was a lot, um, Thoreau wrote the letter to Emerson in January, so we're right in that time period seasonally right now. Um, and he asks if, um, Robert Richardson discusses um, the loss of John and the letter to Emerson in connection with Emerson's poem that he wrote. And I'm going to botch the um, pronunciation probably. Threnody, which um, Threnody, Threnody, yeah. Yeah, so, so is that addressed at all by, by Bob? I think it does come up. Um, I'm sorry, my, but I don't know. Well, no, I can, I can speak to that. Yeah. Thren Threnody is a poem that um, uh, laments uh, the death of little Waldo, and it was composed in stages subsequently. So um, that wouldn't have been part of the um, events of 1842 uh, that uh, Bob takes up uh, in this book, it was uh, subsequent. It was a big repercussion and uh, crucial to come to terms with if you're going to take in uh, the aftermath for Emerson of little Waldo's death. But that's the story on Threnody. Great, I'm sorry. There's a It's a different poem that I'm seeing quoted and it's of um, Thoreau, so sorry. <laughs> um, Someone asked about the, the mini and um, and her effect on James's life. Um, uh, Larry mentioned that um, James was given to depression, and I think one of the links that Bob makes between the two of them is that Minnie also confronted the the sense: it, what's the point of life? And of course, Minnie Minnie's health was failing, and and so maybe she had a different reason to be pondering this, but. Um, they felt very much aligned and allied. And um, James, William James wrote afterwards that, you know, he had, she had taken some part of him into the grave with her. Um, and uh, I think it's as if, I mean, this can be part of, part of uh, recovering from a loss as you take them just as he felt she'd taken part of him into the grave. I think he retained some part of her, part of her questioning and part of her um, sort of level-headed response to the essential tragedy of life. Um, and then that enabled James to uh, reach his own um, pragmatic philosophy. The, you know, my first act of believe, uh, I believe in free will and, and my first act will be to, to, uh, to believe in free will, something I can't quote exactly, um, but um, uh, anyway, I think um, it, it was a kind of dyadic relationship, um, different obviously from the young marriage of of uh, Waldo and Ellen, and from the brothership of John. And John was the older brother of Henry, so how was he to go on without this older brother? Um, uh, Minnie was more of a mate, I think. A, 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 more than a chum, <laughs> but um, someone with whom he had a deep identification and and felt, you know, some hope in her uh, willingness to face down the facts of life. 
uh, the harsh facts. I'm interested in this question of the three, do we know which one Bob had the most affinity for? Hmm. You, any thoughts on that, Larry? Did you ever ask him? Uh, you know, I never did. Um, that's a fascinating question. Uh, I wouldn't dare to pronounce judgment. Ask Annie. Um, <laughs> they came together as a result of the biography of Thoreau. Um, so maybe she would be a biased uh, witness too. Um, I, if I had to pick one of the three, um, I guess I would say uh, more likely Emerson, uh, Bob being um, a, a man of letters rather than a, a, a philosopher or um, an incipient scientist. Uh, the varieties of religious experience side of James, I think, was probably the closest match to uh, to Bob's temperament. And um, the uh, element of um, Thoreau, the woodsman, uh, the outdoors um, aficionado, uh, strikes me as a little less Bob than the man thinking, um, which is an encapsulation of Emerson that he said himself, uh, his definition of the scholar, uh, which was his uh, most common uh, self-image persona in his work. Um, but Bob loved, uh, he loved nature, uh, where he chose to live proves that. Um, but on balance, Emerson, yeah. But I, why do I have to choose? I mean, it's like choosing between well, it uh, could be your uh, friends. Yeah, you know. he loved it. He loved. He was drawn to all three of these uh, as polymaths in their own way, uh, intellectual seekers um, who uh, wrote at best elegant prose um, that hovered on the borderline of uh, literature, philosophy, uh, religion, and um, sometimes social thought, that was Bob. Yeah, and Bob, Bob gives the largest treat. I mean, Emerson is really gives the largest treatment of transcendentalism, and that influences both Thoreau and James, and sort of, to my mind, completes the circle. I was, I was wondering, um, and I don't mean to cut off um, Megan if you'd like to respond to that, but I do, um, looking at the time, um, I'd be really interested to hear if, um, from both of you, do you have a favorite memory of um, Bob and any words on what um, both of you are currently working on? Hmm. And, and, you know, and I'll just take up the question about James Emerson. Yeah. And I think so I was just going to say that I think that um, it's possible that you could see these books as reflecting different stages in Bob's own life. Um, and so the passion for Thoreau was a young passion. The Emerson, who had this sort of fuller life, um, uh, you know, came at midlife or later midlife for Bob or the middle of his writing life. And, and James facing down the demons of, you know, I don't think of Bob as someone who saw too many demons uh, in, he, or he was not himself wrestling with depression the way James did. but you know, life can begin to look a little dark uh, and began to look a little dark in the US. Um, uh, maybe when he was working on the James book and he needed that to go on. But I have a two, I guess two memories of, well, maybe I'll just say, say one that, um, uh, which speaks to his, the, what Larry said about where he chose to live. Um, one of, I don't know what, what kind of a whim on a whim, whatever. Bob had gone or been part of this summer camp in Maine, the Alamusic Island camp, I think it was called, um, which uh, focused on sailing, even though it was sort of in inward in inland Maine. And um, the place um, went out of business and Bob bought it. <laughs> it's a, a summer camp, small camp for 
kids, you know, with little cabins in it. And I was lucky to be able to visit him and Annie when they were staying there one, you know, for a month, one summer. And, and just, you know, we, of course, we, you know, we might as well have been anywhere. We were talking about the Peabody sisters or Emerson or whatever it was. Um, but we were in this very, um, in the middle of a pine forest in, in uh, interior Maine on a lake and the p- pine needles and the scent of it all. And, and uh, it was just such a perfect place for the two of them. Um, and I guess I, I like to remember him there because it, it called up his youth as a camper. Um, and I had had actually a, my freshman roommate at Bennington had uh, gone to Alamusic Island camp and learned to sail on this Concordia yawl that they all went on and blah, blah, blah. So um, for me, it was uh, also a kind of coming together of my past and, and, um, and my present uh, as a biographer. I like to think of him there. He was re- very happy and kind of, I don't know. It was almost like a joke. Why? Why do we have this place? Well, here we are. We do. Um. Yeah, that's a that's a terrific memory. I'm not sure that I can call up anything quite so um, um, sweet and and luminous. But two things that come to mind were uh, that uh, time when he was talking in my presence. I forget whether it was just to me or a group uh, about the challenge of the. Um, James biography, uh, trying to swallow uh, the the sea, as it were, (laughs) if you're going to do a complete uh, bibliographical reconnaissance of James's reading. Uh, And as he sometimes did, he stretched out his um, arms way wide, and he was a tall man, um, and with a sense of wonder described uh, his uh, challenge and perplexity, but also uh, uh, with a kind of twinkle in his eye, I'm going to do it. I'm going to climb that mountain. Um, then the other time I remember um, was uh, the uh, evening I mentioned at our place when uh, he was talking with great um, uh, affection and thoughtfulness about the challenges that his two stepdaughters uh, were facing uh, at that point in their lives, rather different ones. Uh, and uh, there, the, uh, the 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 compassionate side uh, of Bob, um, the empathetic side of Bob, uh, who was a somewhat cerebral guy. Uh, his uh, style of prose is um, uh, a filtered style. Uh, it's uh, distilled um, uh, and not what you would normally call passionate. Uh, that that empathetic side, which was uh, always, I think, behind uh, his uh, his feeling for his subject. Um, he w- his was not a kind of uh, biographical style that took the subject down, cut it down to size. No, no, never. Uh, always uh, trying to illuminate uh, their worlds on their own terms. Well, that came out the element of affection um, and uh, I treasured that uh, having myself um, two daughters grown up um, who've had their wayward episodes, but that's off topic. I also remember one of the first times I met Bob and uh, he was again advising short <laughs> chapters, read everything. And um, this was on Cape Cod and um, as I was, saying goodbye, taking off. He said, Schleiermacher, remember Schleiermacher. (laughs) (laughs) I think he He told me to remember Schleiermacher too. (laughs) Yeah, that that was one of his faves. Hmm. Well, thank you, Thorough Society. And and here's the book. Get the book, read the book. Thank you for sharing the book. Thank you so much. Um, my copy of the book is at the shop at Walden Pond, where I hope to pick it up sometime tomorrow. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you, Megan, Lawrence, and Rochelle. And thank you to um, Princeton University Press for looking to the Third Society to um, assist with the book launch this evening. Great to be here. Great to team with you, Megan. Thanks. Good to see you. Hi, everyone. Bye.